Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On today's show, we're talking about what happens when there are multiple levels of government involved in the property. It's common these days to find properties that are outside the boundary of a municipality. In that case, the rules are set by the county in which the property resides. But there are many cases where multiple levels of governing bodies are involved, and it's incredibly easy to make assumptions about whose rules you need to meet. Let me give you a few examples, because I want you to be sensitized to the web of complexity that often exists in reality. Imagine you had a property that was legally in the county, but a city street needed to access the property. It doesn't even have to be directly in front of you. You need that city street to get access to the property, and that street is owned by the city. Zoning and construction in that case would be approved by the county, as you would expect. But there could be an extra layer of city approval required, since the property would rely on a city service in order to gain access. The city may require you to conduct a traffic study in order to approve the extra traffic that would be in the future loading those city-owned streets. The city may overload its traffic approval by imposing additional requirements that have nothing to do with traffic whatsoever. Now, this may seem unfair at first. After all, the city has no jurisdiction over the property. But cities have a tendency to grow. And when that happens, they want lands that are annexed into the city to follow city guidelines. So often these rules are imposed by contemplating the future possibility of annexation by the city. I've seen cases where the property in the county may require you to drill a well for water and install your own septic. City services for water and sewer could be close by, but in order to use those services, you might be required to meet the city's zoning rules for a property that's not actually in the city. These examples of government overreach exist all over the place. Earlier this week, I had a conversation with the mayor of a town, and he acknowledged that the property was in the county, but the services were provided by the city, and the road is owned by the state. In order to gain access to the services, the property would need to be annexed into the city, and the state would need to approve access to the road. So if you wanted to put in an extra driveway, approval from a third level of government would be required. We had another conversation with the planning department of a city in Texas. They acknowledged the property was in the county. Subdividing the property would fall within the approvals of the county, and zoning would also be approved by the county. But the property falls within the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the city. And that's an important word that you need to become familiar with. Extraterritorial jurisdictions are the legal ability of a government to exercise authority beyond its normal boundaries. And any authority can claim an ETJ, an extraterritorial jurisdiction, over any external territory they wish. For this particular nine-acre property in question, the county would happily approve the subdivision of the land into two parcels. The back parcel would gain access to the road with the granting of an access easement, a 40-foot wide strip of land for a nice wide driveway. So far, so good. Everything seemed to check all the boxes. But then the city planner informed us that the property fell under site plan control of the extraterritorial jurisdiction. In order to build on the property, it would require a minimum of 130 feet of frontage on the road, anything less, and the building permit would not be approved. These are situations that come up all the time. That very fact killed the project. There are situations where rainwater or snow runoff flows into officially named watersheds. In that case, the development plan might fall under control of the local conservation authority, the Ministry of the Environment, or the Army Corps of Engineers, whichever body has jurisdiction of the water flow in the area. These rules can affect the types of uses that are permitted on the property, how runoff from the property has to be handled, and therefore what kind of density is going to be possible. You might be required to detain any runoff and divert it into a managed stormwater sewer, contributing no more than a defined rate of flow into that stormwater management system. Your engineering team needs to dedicate acreage to stormwater detention. But understand, you've got two and possibly three different regulatory bodies, each with their own distinct approval processes, dictating what can be done on your property. Some areas require community input from surrounding neighbors and these community meetings need to be documented. You need to respond to residents' concerns. One town, north of New York City, has an architectural review board made up of eight architects who will look at the feedback from residents at the community meeting, and they have the right to comment on your proposed design. In the words of one developer I spoke with recently, 
is like being back in university and having your professor tell you how things should be done. If the neighborhood has a mature neighborhood overlay in the zoning, it means the community could have design input on anything you might build on your property. As you think about that, pay very close attention to all the different government and regulatory bodies that could control what you build on your property. Have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.